Hello, everyone, and welcome to ACS Webinars, connecting you with the best and brightest minds in chemistry, live from Washington, D.C. I'm Mike David, and I will be your host for today's webinar, which we are co-producing with the ACS Division of Professional Relations. We would love to get you involved in the discussion, where you can share your thoughts and questions in the questions panel. You can also join the discussion on Twitter by including at AmeriChem Society in your tweet. The slides for today's webinar can be accessed right now by clicking on the link you see in the GoToWebinar control panel. An invitation to view the unedited recording from today's presentation will be sent to everyone that registered. This will be open access for a 24-hour period, after which it will be removed, edited, and become an ACS member benefit at acs.org. Our moderator for today is Annabelle Olinko, a chemistry graduate student at Iowa State University, interested in using both technical, scientific, and humanities skills as a chemistry and communication scholar to advance science policy and get the public engaged with science. And with that, Annabelle, I will turn it over to you to get us started. All right, thanks, Mike. And hello, everyone, for tuning in from wherever you are. I'm happy to introduce and honored to introduce Celia Elliott, who is an academic professional with extensive experience in grant and proposal writing and journal publishing. Uh, she works closely with the department head and associate heads to develop external and internal resources to allow the department to meet its mission of education, research, and public service. And she works with faculty to increase external funding um, of their research programs. Uh, beyond that, she's also involved with the development of uh, different writing programs, including the senior thesis sequence for the undergraduate physics majors since its inception in 2000. She's currently teaching teen teaching with her uh, professor Taylor Hughes, a course on technical communication and research skills. Um, and she's assisted in developing writing courses for graduate students and contributed to programmatic activities um, for research experiences. For so lots of technical writing experience that we're going to be hearing from today um, and learn more about how we can turn that to our own writing. So Celia, I'll leave it to you. Thank you so much, Annabelle, for a kind introduction. And without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So I want to talk to you today about my practice habits of revising tech, <laughs> technical manuscripts. And uh, I should, should say, first off, that I am largely self-taught uh, in this business of technical writing, technical communications, and the <clears throat> opinions that I will express today are solely my own and not necessarily shared by the University of Illinois or the American Chemical Society, although they should be. So in the, the adver advertisement that uh, Mike sent out for um, the webinar, he one of the bullet points he made was you could use this to uh, learn how to avoid abstractitis. So I thought I'd start out, first of all, by saying what abstract Writus is. And this definition was given by Sir Ernest Gowers, who was a, uh, an academic um, uh, 19th, early 20th century British uh, educator and uh, writer. Uh, and he defined abstract titus as writing that was so abstruse that not even the writer knew what he or she was trying to say. Um, this is a, a, an extract from one of Gower's papers that was published in the Yale Law Review, where he talks about this business of abstractitis. And in this particular uh, quotation, he was describing the US Internal Revenue Service Code. Uh, but I think a lot of what he complains about in, in writing about the IRS code could easily be applied to science papers as well. So there are sort of three things you can do to avoid abstractitis. The first thing is to clarify. Um, replace uh, abstract technical jargon uh, with meaningful, concrete nouns and verbs that will be uh, meaningful for your audience. The second way to avoid abstractitis is to quantify, to replace qualitative 
adjectives and adverbs with quantitative descriptors. Uh, chemistry is a quantitative science, and uh, our writing should be just as precise as the experiments that you do. And the third way to uh, control abstractitis is to objectify, to give concrete examples, to use analogies, to make what you're describing come alive in a meaningful way for your audience. Um, I think the biggest mistake that many novice writers make is not allowing enough time to do the rewriting that is necessary to have a good outcome for, um, for your uh, final manuscript. And I think it takes about as much time for revision as it does for writing a paper in the first place. Um, when you're revising your manuscript, once you've got a draft done that you're fairly satisfied with, I think you need to concentrate on four different elements in the paper. Um, the first thing to look at is to look at the ideas. Um, how have you presented and clarified the ideas that are embodied in your paper? And how have you expressed them in a way that will be meaningful and understandable to your audience? Second step is to look at the structure of that presentation of ideas and make sure that it's organized logically, that a reader can follow you from the introduction through point A to point B to point C to your conclusions in a very smooth, linear flow. The third element of revising is evaluating the use of language. Um, is the emphasis correct? Is the tone matter of fact and, and um, non-biased? Non uh, is the vocabulary that you've used, is it going to be understandable and meaningful to your audience? And finally, the, the last step of revising is proofreading, where you look at individual words to make sure that there are no mechanical errors in grammar, in punctuation, in spelling, uh, and so on. And uh, during this talk, we'll look at each one of these elements separately to see how to uh, maximize your, your efficiency in, in, in your revising. Um, I think, ideally, revising should proceed in three steps. Um, the first step is to confirm the content and logical organization, to, to look at the ideas and uh, be sure that you have presented uh, everything that you wanted to discuss in a logical fashion. The next step is editing. And in editing, you look at style uh, and usage, language, tone, emphasis. And then finally, the third step is proofreading for mechanics, where you look at the spelling, the punctuation, the grammar. Um, I think it's important to allow time for each step. And I think it is most efficient to run through your revising in these three steps in this order. Uh, if you start out uh, and get bogged down looking for proofreading for mechanics, you may overlook this main idea of the content logical organization. Um, and you, you have to allow sufficient time for each step. I've been in the physics department at the University of Illinois for 31 years. And one thing I've learned from the physicists if, is that if you get to this point in a talk and you haven't shown an equation yet, you have no credibility at all. So this is the Elliott edit editing equations, uh, which express the time it takes to actually revise a technical manuscript, where T is the time it really takes, H is the number of hours you think any idiot could do it in, and epsilon is not necessarily trivial. This is, this is the case, this equation is for single author papers. 
uh, in the event of multiple authors of a paper, uh, the Elliott editing equation is times equal five times the hours that you expect to be able to do it in, and A is the number of authors involved, and E is still not necessarily trivial. It always takes more time than you expect. So how do we sort of break this down? First step is look at the science first. Uh, we're gonna look at it at the what I call the macroscopic scale, view from 10,000 feet. Um, and the things, things you wanna concentrate on during this step are these, these following uh, elements. Is the information valid, significant, timely, and complete? Is the context clear? Have you uh, established the, the context for the work that you're reporting? What's new and different? What have you contributed to this longstanding problem? What, what's the motivation for what you did? Next step is, is the information presented at an appropriate level for the audience and purpose? Uh, you're going to write a manuscript for a general journal, such as the US uh, Journal Science, is gonna be at a different level of detail because the audience is broader than it would be for a very narrow focused uh, chemistry specialty journal. Um, you wanna look at the logic at this step. Is the narrative arranged in a logical coherent structure? Is there, are there any assumptions that haven't been discussed? Are there any gaps in your, in your logical narrative? And at this point, you want to look at your figures, your equations, and your tables as well, and make sure that they are well integrated into the narrative of the text, and also that they support and emphasize and clarify the main points that you want to make. I think at this stage, you want to get a good overview of the whole paper. And this is a tip that I've learned over the years that I think uh, can be very helpful. And that is once you've got your manuscript pretty much ready to go, just cut and paste the first sentence of every paragraph into a new word processing document and read the new document out loud. That will show you any, any bumps in the logical structure. Uh, this will, will let you see that the context is clear. It will show you any gaps or unexplained uh, assumptions that you may have incorporated in the paper. Uh, it'll show you, are the conclusions supported by the evidence that you've laid out? And it'll also help you identify any redundancies or extraneous information that you can cut right now uh, and improve the clarity and the uh, cohesiveness of your manuscript. I think it's also important to include summary statements periodically through your manuscript. So typically what I teach my students is at the end of each paragraph, provide a summary statement of what was presented in that paragraph in a way that leads logically to the topic sentence in the next paragraph. In the same way, you can Put a summary statement at the end of each subsection that leads logically into the next section, subsection. You can put summary statements at the end of each section in your paper, a summary statement at the end of the introduction, a summary statement at the end of the methods and procedures, and so on. Uh, and I think it's always a good idea to provide a summary statement at the very end of the paper to remind the reader what the main ideas were, what the main points were, uh, end with a bang, not a whimper. The idea of adding summary statements helps your reader sort of follow your logical argument. And if they get to a summary statement, it reminds them, okay, do I, have I understood everything that's gone up to this point? If not, I need to go back and reread. So with that introduction, I'd like to turn things over to Mike now, who will have a poll question for you. 
All right. And our first poll question for everyone is, how much time should you allow for revising a technical manuscript? And you can select one of the options you see on the screen just by clicking on one of those white radio buttons. It would, uh, <laughs> apologies. And your choices are an hour per page. It depends on how technical the text is. At least three times longer than you think it will take, or it doesn't matter. You'll have to revise it again when you get the reviewer's comments. And with that, um, I will close this down shortly. Do want to remind everyone, we are excited for your questions and uh, comments for the Q&A session, and feel free to enter those in at any time. You don't need to wait until uh, Celia's presentation is over. All right, and I will close this poll in five, four, three, two, one. And uh, highest percentage, 71% said three times longer than you think it will take. Next highest at 19% was depends on how technical the text is. And the other two didn't get above 10%. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, so on the sort of first pass through the paper, we focused on the ideas. Second pass, we're gonna focus on the style. We're gonna put our, our paper under a manuscript and crank up the mag magnification. Now, uh, and in, in this pass, we're going to focus on how we use language to describe the ideas that we want the audience to understand. So the first thing to look at is, is just look at the words that we've used. Are they precise? Are they unambiguous? Um, are they terms that are understandable and meaningful for the audience? And again, you'll scale this according to your prospective audience. Um, one of the simplest ways to vastly improve your writing in general is to just write shorter sentences, straightforward declarative sentences of no more than 25 to 30 words each. And the reason for that is this. English is very simple language grammatically. For those of you who don't speak English as a first language, you might not believe me. And I can see the spelling and pronunciation are impossible. But the grammar itself is pretty simple. Uh, unlike highly inflected languages, in English we spell words, we spell nouns the same way, whether they're the subject of a sentence or an object of a verb or an object of a preposition. Uh, we spell some words the same way, whether we're using them as a noun or a verb or an adjective. And the only way we extract meaning from sentences in English is by the order of the words, by the relationship of one word to the other words in the sentence. And if you string together great long convoluted sentences, it's just hard in English to figure out who's doing what to whom. So keep your sentences fairly short. Another way you can improve the precision and, and clarity and conciseness of your writing is to use action verbs, not weak verbs of being. And I'll give you some tips for how to do that in a little, a little bit. And finally, eliminate all what I call fluffy stuff. Um, excessive words, uh, unnecessary words, and we'll do some practice on that in a few minutes. So first of all, write shorter sentences. Here, here is an example that I took from a, a, a published paper where the sentence is 63 words long. It is grammatically perfectly correct, but it's impossible to understand on the first reading, uh, even if you're a atmospheric um, physicist or, or chemist. A program of chemical analysis and receptor modeling is proposed in which samples obtained at the EBENTEK sites will be used to estimate the source and or source regions of trace elemental deposition into the area and the effects of specific urban areas on airborne particulate matter compositions and thus their potential contribution to the contamination of the area's water supplies. It's just impossible to understand. You have to read it three or four times to sort of sort out, uh, you know, what's going on in this sentence. Another uh, thing to avoid is 
long strings of nouns used as adjectives, what we call stacked nouns or stacked, adjectives, stacked adjectives. And they're just really hard to sort out what's all going on here. Um, one thing that I teach my students is what I call the three preposition rule. And that is no sentence shall contain more than three prepositional phrases. If it's got more than three prepositional phrases in it, it has to be revised because there's just too much going on in that sentence to, to understand what it means. So here's an example. A pollution problem with diesel engines has historically been their tendency to produce soot and smoke but oxygen in the methyl ester group leads to lower suit emissions from diesel engines when using biodiesel fuel. Uh, I've highlighted in yellow the, the five prepositions in this sentence. And here's how I would fix it. Um, first of all, cut it up into two sentences so you don't have more than three prepositions and three preposition phrases in one sentence. Um, put what the main idea, make the main idea of what the subject of the sentence is. In the, the original example, uh, a pollution problem is the subject of the sentence. We replace this sort of vague, a pollution problem with air polluting soot and smoke. That's now the subject of the sentence. It's much easier for a reader to process and understand. Um, so anytime you, you have one of these long run-on sentences that has a bunch of prepositional phrases in, look hard at those sentences. See how you can split them up into more than one sentence and see how you can make the main idea the subject of the sentence. And as I said, sometimes you just have to start over. Um, a good trick that technical editors use are keeping verbs close to the subject of the sentence. So here's an example, several schemes. The blue underline is the subject of the sentence and the orange underline is the verb. So several schemes ranging from minimal computational cost and poor accuracy to high computational cost and high accuracy can be employed. Just invert that sentence and put the verb right after the subject. Schemes can be employed. And then you give the example of the schemes. A program to be used in conjunction with a PC data acquisition card was written. Get that dangling verb back right after the subject. Program was written for what? Much easier to understand, much more concise, uh, much more cohesive. Um, it's always easier, I think, to understand an idea when it's expressed as a positive rather than a negative. It's not only easier to understand, it's usually more concise. So here's an example. Although some data supported the hypothesis, it could not be concluded that output scaled linearly with current. Here's how to revise that. Output appeared to scale nonlinearly with current. Now we've got our subject is a subject rather than this sort of vague it. Uh, and we've got a much sort of more concise sentence. Here's another example. Arcing under high current operation could not be avoided without the use of the insulated feed through. There's an awful lot going on in this sentence that's just hard to keep track of. So we replace it with the insulated feed through. Now we've got the feed through as the subject of the sentence prevented arcing even during high current operation. Um, one thing that I pound into my students is to avoid this kind of indirect construction of starting with there are or it is. Put the subject first and just plunge right into your sentence. So here's an example. There is clearly a need for an observable sensitive to changes in the nuclear shape and common to all isotopes problem with this sentence is this sort of vague, there are, and wimpy verb of being. We change that by, by saying what the subject of the sentence is, an observable, is needed. 
that is sensitive to changes in nuclear shape and common to all isotopes. So that brings us to our next poll question, and I'll turn things over to Michael. All right, our next question for all of you is, what is the easiest way to improve, improve the clarity of your writing? And here are your uh, responses. Use very technical jargon for accuracy. Write shorter sentences. Don't just say what something is, also say what it is not. Or finally, include a lot of qualifying phrases. And with that, I am going to close this poll in five, four, three, two, one. I thought it was going to stay at 100% the entire time, but we finally had 96% say write shorter sentences, 3% uh, say use very technical jargon for accuracy, and 1% saying include a lot of qualifying phrases. So did our audience get it right? Absolutely. And I would say about the technical jargon, again, it depends on your audience. If you're writing for experts in your very technical field, you can use as much technical jargon as you'd like. But the problem, I think, for so many of us is once you get past about the third year of graduate school, for the rest of your career, you're going to be explaining to your, explaining your science to people who know less about it than you do sometimes considerably less. And so that ability to sort of tune your language to your intended audience, to be able to express your ideas in terms that are familiar and understandable and meaningful to the audience are one of the most important tools you have in your toolkit. Okay, moving right along. Uh, here are some other tips straight from the old copy editor. Eliminate unnecessary words. So you've got this phrase, the results tend to suggest they are both identical, uh, estimated to be. The words here in italics and orange are things that you can eliminate um, without losing any meaning uh, in your phrasing, but making them considerably shorter. I'd also say if your results are only tending to suggest something, are you really ready to write a paper about it in the first place? So here are some other examples. Uh, yellow is a color. You don't have to say it's yellow in color. Um, an ellipse is a shape. You don't have to say elliptical in shape. Uh, in order is one of those clutch phrases that we all use, but that can usefully be edited out of every place it appears uh, in a technical manuscript. Um, it is known that. Well, if it's known that, just say what it is. Um, and I'm not the only one that thinks this. The very um, authoritative scientific style and format says it too. Phrase such, it is interesting to note that adds no information and only delays in getting to the point of the sentence. Um, you can replace wordy expressions with simple, straightforward, pithy English words. And so let's let's test your, your ability to do that. So wordy phrase due to the fact that, what do you replace it with? Because in the near future, soon, a very limited number of cases, few. It appears to be indicated that, apparently, in spite of the fact that, although despite, subsequent to, after, at the present time. Now, in consequence of this fact, thus, as compared with, versus, in combination with, with, you can really improve your writing a lot if you just, just tune yourself to be aware of these wordy expressions and replace them with these very simple, straightforward, pithy English words. Here's another good trip, tip, trick for um, science writers that we copy editors use, 
in English for words that are de derived from Latin, we make verbs into nouns by adding T-I-O-N or M-E-N-T or A-N-C-E at the end of the sentence. So act becomes action, act, verb, action, noun. Manage, verb, management, noun. And one way to really improve the, the directness and, and crispness of your writing is every time you see one of those nouns that end in T-I-O-N, M-E-N-T, or A-N-C-E, turn them back into the verb that they came from. So here's an example. The most common use for Raman spectroscopy is for the observation of phonons. We see that T-I-O-N and immediately our senses perk up and we think, okay, how do we turn that back into the verb? Raman spectroscopy is most commonly used to observe phonons. We've got now got a nine word sentence instead of a 13 word sentence, but look what else we've done. We've made Raman spectroscopy the subject of the sentence. Now that comes first. Here's another example. We proceeded to make an arrangement of the superconducting islands on the substrate with the STM tip. M-E-N-T. Okay, how, how do we change that back into a verb? We arranged the superconducting islands on the substrate. 12 words versus 17. I am a diehard to the barricade supporter of the passive voice in technical writing. And another way to change this sentence, uh, in addition to, to changing the noun back into the verb it came from, is to express the idea in the passive voice. In the, the first 12 word improvement, we have the subject of the sentence is we, look what we did. Well, that's very nice, but I don't really care who you are. What I want to see as the subject of the sentence are the superconducting islands. That's what the point of this expression is, or the idea is. So we still put the arrangement back into the verb form, but we put it in the passive voice now. So we have the superconducting islands were arranged on the subtrip using the STM tip. Okay, now we've, we've been through the ideas, we've been through the use of language, now we're ready to proofread. And we're gonna put our, micro, our, our um, manuscript back under the microscope, microscope, crank up the magnification one more time, and we're going to really look at the mechanics of, of the paper itself. So the first step, revising, we concentrated on the ideas. Second step, editing, we concentrated on the language and the style. Now we're going to concentrate on the mechanics. Um, and the importance of proofreading, in my opinion, cannot be overstated. Um, and this is partly a cultural um, uh, predilection, I think, but Americans in general are very critical of of what we consider careless errors in written manuscripts. And for those of you who don't speak and write English as a first language, that's not fair. Uh, it's not just, it's probably cultural imperialism, but it's just the way it is. And uh, your editors and reviewers are going to see mistakes, see these mechanical stakes and spelling, grammar, uh, punctuation as careless errors, and it's going to raise immediate questions in reviewers' minds of how carefully did you do this experiment? Uh, are you paying attention to detail if you have these kinds of mechanical errors? So when you're proofreading, you're not thinking about the ideas. You're not really thinking about the language. You're looking at one word at a time to see if it's correct. Um, so the, the kinds of things you need to be aware of when you're proofreading are acronyms, mathematical symbols, special characters, are they used consistently, are they defined at first usage? Um, is the formatting and typography consistent and does it conform to the manuscript preparation rules? Um, have you observed technical writing 
conventions. Um, things like lowercase t equals time, uppercase t equals temperature. Uh, your grammar and your spelling are flawless. Uh, and he, this is the old proofreader here. I actually own that hat. And uh, here are some tips for this sort of thing. Tip number one is print out a hard copy of the manuscript and proofread from a hard copy. I don't know why it is, but for some reason, mistakes that you are completely oblivious to on the screen will just jump in your face when you read them from a hard copy. Tip number two is instead of reading top to bottom, left to right, as the way we do read normally in English, start at the lower right corner and read backwards and from the bottom to the top. Doing that forces you to look at each word individually and you see the mistakes, not what you expect to see when you're reading from left to right. And finally, proofread everything, not just the technical narrative, but the captions on the figures and the titles on the tables and the running head on each page uh, and the spelling of your collaborators in the acknowledgments section. Uh, proofread the equations very carefully. Um, don't just read the words, read everything that's on the page. Um, you want to maintain what I call witless consistency through the text. You always call the same things by the same names. If you've talked about a solar absorber, pages one through four of a manuscript, and then on page five, you start calling it the solar collector, careful readers are going to be confused. They're going to think, you know, you're talking about something else now that's somehow different from a solar absorber. Um, be consistent in your use of italics and boldface in the, the typography of subsection headings and section headings uh, in the manuscript. Um, be consistent in the way you express numbers. Be consistent in your use of symbols or special characters. Um, be consistent in how you you format the legends in figures. Um, I saw a manuscript once where um, the uh, it, it was on superconductivity, and so they had you know various figures that showed the magnetic field and the electrical field. And for figures one through four, the B field was blue and the electrical field was red, uh, indicated by red arrows. And then on figure five, it was reversed. And now the B field was red and the electrical field symbols were blue. And it was just very confusing. If you read the caption, then you understood what, what was being um, shown in the manuscript. But by that point in the manuscript, you had had in your own mind that B field equals blue and E field equals red. Um, be consistent in the use of color. Pe oops. People ex expect change to mean something. And even if it's a very subtle change, a careful reader will pick up on it and think and be confused and say, you know, wh what does this change mean? So to recap, first pass, for, focus on important ideas and logical structure. Second pass, focus on the language. And the final proofreading stage, focus on any mechanical errors. And when you do your revising, do things in these steps, in this order. Um, you want to constantly be on the, the lookout for how can you clarify or quantify or objectify the ideas that you're presenting. Um, you want to go through on your language pass and eliminate any redundancies or wordy expression to make things just as, as precise and con concise as you can make them. Uh, finally, always, always, always proofread from a hard copy. And so this concludes uh, the formal part of our presentation today. I'm going to turn things back over to Annabelle now, who will help us with the Q&A. 
All right. So before we dive right into the Q&A, I did want to talk about the co-sponsor for this ACS webinar. The Division of Professional Relations is the division that I am a part of. We are concentrated on elevating professionalism. So whether it's picking up your communication skills, learning a little bit more about your career, um, and getting opportunities in leadership, we are the home for every Christmas. Um, so we hope that you come and celebrate our 50th anniversary, whether it's virtually or in person, um, through our programming at uh, San Francisco for the fall national meeting. Um, but you can reach out to us, check out our website at acsprof.org. Um, we have seven different subdivisions as well, so you can connect with the community there. Um, and that is the division. So. Without further ado, I'll go ahead and shift over to our Q&A session now. Um, Celia, there have been lots and lots of questions. And I think the first one I want to kick us off with is, um, I think something that's been really uh, the focus now um, over the last few months about the use of tools and technology. So with, the, with artificial intelligence coming in with, um, building in chatbots, building in AI through Grammarly or um, ChatGPT, what is their place um, in the writing, in the revision process? Uh, how do you feel about using those tools to kind of help uh, a writer? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, thank you, Annabelle and questioners. Um, I. If I had been a physicist, I would have been an experimentalist. I am a very pragmatic kind of person. Just, you know, make it work. And I, I know in academia now, there's a lot of angst about, do we let students use AI, chat GPT, and so on? And my feeling is, if the ideas are solid, why not use technology that can help you improve clarity and communication aspect uh, of your writing. Um, it, it's sort of like we've let students use calculators for years. And when the electronic calculator came into, I'm old enough to remember, uh, there was a great deal of, of controversy about whether we let students use calculators in class or on exams. Why not? I mean. Who does long division anymore? Who does who calculates square roots by hand anymore? Um, and I feel I feel sort of that way about the new uh, AI um, tools for improving uh, improving grammar and improving writing. Um, if if using those tools lets a student concentrate more on the ideas that he or she is trying to present, that's fine with me. Mm -hmm. What do you think about, um, I guess, how tools can sort of help with figuring out um, plagiarism, citation, similarity scores? Like, is that still best kind of hand, you know, revising or can we lean on some of those tools? I know we talked a little bit more about how, helping write, but maybe sort of in that mm -hmm. revision process, where does that yeah. then, yeah. I, I think um, this this whole business of, of plagiarism is uh, it gotten a lot more murky mm -hmm. um, with the, the use of these tools. Um, I think I would use them cautiously just in that regard. Um, if you are found guilty of plagiarism, it is career suicide. I mean, that's just the end. And so um, I think it's something that you have to be aware of. Mm -hmm. It's not something, I'm not in journal publishing uh, okay. now. Um, and, and when I was, it wasn't that that serious a or that hard to define. I mean, plagiarism was usually just very self-evident. Mm -hmm. um, 
but um, I think it's gotten more complicated now. And, and uh, I would encourage you uh, for your ACS webinars to have an expert uh, talk to your audience. And, and unfortunately, I'm not that expert. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we do also, some of the questions were about word usage, so they're hopefully fairly short. Um, okay. Thoughts on things like word usage of utilize versus use? Um, you know, <laughs> what I really like about my job mm -hmm. is I, I I can answer about 99.99% of the questions that I'm asked with, it depends. Mm -hmm. So, um, utilize just sounds more mechanical to me, and it might be appropriate in some, in some uh, contexts, but I tend to favor just simple, straightforward words. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a very similar one where we had therefore versus thus and the whole idea about what's interchangeable versus not. And mm -hmm. so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, one thing I think that might be helpful about hearing from you about words is this idea of we, we walk through kind of shortening um, those wordy expressions mm -hmm. and um, one of our audience members was talking about the fact that it took a lot of time and effort to kind of show off these wordy expressions as a way to show that we have um, higher English knowledge. So mm -hmm. how do you balance this wanting to feel like sounds you're... Sounds scholarly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, sounds yeah. scholarly. But also make sure that you're still making things clear and concise. Yeah, yeah. I, I take the contrarian view that using a whole lot of words doesn't make you sound scholarly. It just makes you sound turgid and imprecise. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I've had students that when I, I, you know, showed them how to simplify their writing, they tell me, no, that's not the point. The point is to show how smart they are. Mm -hmm. And I think using a lot of these very wordy expressions doesn't show how smart you are. It just shows how much work you're making your reader go through to understand your ideas. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I just don't buy that. Right. Yeah. Okay. Then how, how do you feel a little bit where some of our audience members are trying to learn how to write more varied sentences or are just trying to get into the habit of um, better simplified writing. So what would you what would you say like to those who are like, my writing feels really repetitive or mm -hmm. yeah. um, I'm not sure that I have the vocabulary or just the the way with words. Um, right. Um, yeah. Writing 25 word sentences, subject, verb, object, subject, verb, object, subject, verb, object, can be choppy and seem repetitive. Um, one, one way you can break that up a little bit is to use an introductory phrase that sets the sentence in time or place or presents a contrast um, to get a little bit smoother flow. But you know, science writing ain't Shakespeare. Yeah. Uh, don't don't worry about sounding scholarly, sound, sounding elegant. Just make sure people understand what you're writing. Um, for vocabulary, there's one there's one book I recommend that I get no, I'm not and I'm not getting any payback from the author for this, but a really good book to help you increase your vocabulary in English is a book called Word Power Made Easy by Norman Lewis. And I really like it a lot. Um, for one, one thing, it breaks words up into sort of families of words. So you learn a bunch of associated words and learn to distinguish sort of the nuances between this, these various words in this family of words. 
um, is also very helpful because it has uh, uh, worksheets that you can fill out as you're learning that help you sort of test your knowledge and, and go back and check on things. And I like it really a lot. Um, another book that I highly recommend is um, uh, Brian Gardner's Modern American Usage. Uh, it's published by Oxford University Press. Um, and uh, Gardner really takes a lot of problematic words uh, and sort of defines how they should be used, shows how they are misused uh, by writers in English. Um, he's very witty. It, it, it's an enjoyable book to read. It's arranged like a dictionary. Uh, and I never have it further than about one arm's reach from my my computer when I'm writing myself. Um, and his his advice is just spot on. I I agree with Bran Garner probably 95% of the time. He's occasionally wrong, but most of the time he's just dead on. Okay, great book recommendations. Um, and then there are audience members who are really interested about the revision process as it's helping, like as you're getting feedback from others. So whether or not this is like your manuscript and the reviewers or just folks who are look, other folks who are looking at the process, how do, how do you engage and have that conversation on, you know, what works best in concise language, like kind of in this collaborative sense, you talked a little bit about sort of the um, Eliot's equations on editing right. and more of right. maybe the uh, humanistic part of trying to deal with with feedback from others in the revision right. process. That's a really great question. Um, and I think both for um, red team reviewers or your collaborators, uh, when they're they're questioning things in the manuscript, as well as, as journal reviewers. The, the best approach is to examine each one of their comments individually, find out what, what the problem is, what, what is there that they don't understand or they think isn't expressed as well as it could be, and be open to that. I mean, we all have this pride of authorship. When we write something, we think obviously that's the way it's supposed to be written. But if somebody doesn't understand that or doesn't quite get the emphasis of it, that's very useful feedback to have. And I think it's just a matter of engaging. Well, you know, what is confusing about this to you? How do you think I could express this better? Um, do I need to go back and and provide some additional background information before we plunge right into this. Uh, and you know, as long as you can can accept the criticism from the standpoint, this is somebody who wants me to do a, to write a better paper, then I think uh, that to the extent that you can be non-defensive and and realize, well, maybe it makes perfect sense to me, but this person who's reading it doesn't know as much about it as I do. So I should listen to what he or she has to say. Mm -hmm. And then um, there were a couple of comments that wanted to know a little bit more about why you felt so strongly about the use of passive voice and how do you get away from not getting distracted by word when it's underlining, hey, this should be better in an active Yeah, yeah, yeah this is the passive voice. Um, yeah. reason I like passive voice is it puts the emphasis on what was found, not who did the finding. Mm -hmm. It puts puts the emphasis on the idea, makes that the subject of the sentence, rather than we did this, we did that. You know, who cares who adjusted the timing mechanism on the laser? Um, that that's the main reason. And okay. you know, there's, there's been this controversy about passive voice versus active voice forever. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, according to Marion Webster, 25% of the sentences in most uh, physical sciences technical papers are written in the passive voice. So mm -hmm. 
just all a tempest in a teacup, maybe. But I think I think the real value of the passive voice is it puts it puts the idea as the subject of the sentence, not the agent who did the activity. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then kind of as we're nearing the sort of end, this one question I have for you is how do you know when edits are complete? Sometimes you mentioned <laughs> about how revision can take longer than expected and sometimes three yeah. times as long. Um, how do you know when 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 it's done? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. That's a great question. Um, I, honestly, thank God, when I was getting my formal education, we had typewriters, not word processors, or I would have never graduated. <laughs> I can edit things endlessly, and each iteration is incrementally a little bit better than the last one. But so at some point, you have to just say, "This is good enough for government work. We're done." Mm -hmm. um, and so that that is something that your reviewers and your collaborators can help you with. Um, it's nice in science that we have deadlines usually that we need. Um, but you know it, it's also important to to realize that at some point you have to be done. Just mm -hmm. get out the door and be done. Yeah. All right. Well, as we're as you wrap up your final thoughts, um, I think one thing for sure that many of the audience members um, had asked. Uh, was about any resources and tips you've you've shared quite a bit with books and links to your works. Are there any resources and tips um, that you haven't shared yet that you'd like to share? And particularly for any of our international audience uh, and for folks where English isn't their first language, any particular items for them to highlight? Oh, shameless self-promotion alert. Uh -huh. I put a uh, all of my materials that I've developed for my classes on my personal website at the University of Illinois. Uh, if you go to physics.illinois.edu slash people slash Celia, C-E-L-I-A, it'll take you to my personal website. Scroll down past the departmental propaganda at the top of the page, and all of the links to my materials are uh, they're on that website. They're in PDF. Uh, they're downloadable free of charge. I'm always welcome to get feedback on the materials. You're probably not going to change my mind, but I, <laughs> I do welcome feedback. Um, and uh, they're good. Uh, there's another good book um, that was written by Scott Montgomery uh, called Scientific Writing. Scientific writing and format, communicating in science. Scott Montgomery's Communicating in Science, it's the University of Chicago Science Series, is very good introductory uh, book. Another uh, book that I like very much is Vernon Booth's um, Communicating in Science. Booth was a legendary editor at Cambridge University Press, and uh, it, it's a Thin little book, but the advice he gives is just excellent. Um, he is British, and he makes some unfortunate comments about us North Americanos. Um, but other than that, uh, I really like that book. And um, a third one, it's, it's an old book, uh, but, but I think very valuable. It's by Herb, Herbert Michelson. It's called uh, How to Write... How to Write and Publish Science and Engineering Papers. I think it's a name, Herbert Michelson, Oryx, O-R-Y-X Press. Uh, and it's, he was the editor for uh, the IBM Technology Journal for years and years. And uh, I think his advice is just excellent as well. Okay, any other final thoughts? I don't think so. Go out and, and communicate your science and write shorter sentences. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much, Celia. And Mike, you have the floor. All right. Well, Annabelle, thank you so much for joining us today and doing such a fantastic job moderating all those questions and comments that were coming in. 
And Celia, of course, thank you for taking the time to provide such sound advice on how we can all improve our writing a little bit. As we say goodbye, I would like to invite everyone in the audience uh, to our upcoming free webinars. Now, for those of you who had questions about AI, you might be interested in our next webinar on Thursday, August 10th, discover how we can responsibly use artificial intelligence tools like ChatGPT to improve how we learn, teach, and write about chemistry. On Wednesday, August 16th, we will be partnering with the Mexican Chemical Society for a discussion in Spanish on the development of recombinant monoclonal antibodies, their production with an emphasis on purification platforms. And finally, on Thursday, August September, <laughs> August, on Thursday, September 7th, learn how to choose a mentor during all stages of your career, how to recognize imposter syndrome and ways to overcome it. And finally, how to champion diversity and why it is important to do so. We would love to hear what you think about our program and you can reach out to us through all the ACS social media channels. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, or simply email us at acswebinars at acs.org. We're, of course, curious to hear what you thought of today's broadcast, and a short survey will pop up directly after the webinar that will take just a minute to complete. Also, remember that an invitation email to view the recording from today's presentation will be sent to all registrants. This will be open for a 24-hour period, after which it will be removed, edited, and become an ACS member benefit. And that wraps up our program for today. On behalf of us, 